In Plato's dialogue Crito, Crito appeals to his friend Socrates in prison to escape and save himself from execution. Crito's case in this dialogue bears an interesting resemblance to the case made by Odysseus in the Embassy to Achilles in Book 9 of Homer's Iliad. In this video, I will explore some of the parallels between these two stories and then ask about how we might understand Socrates and Plato's presentation of him in Crito in a new way in light of those resemblances. In Book 9 of the Iliad, Achilles is on his ship. He is refusing to fight on behalf of the Greeks. He has withdrawn from the battle because he feels his honor has been slighted by the commander Agamemnon, who has not given him due honor and has taken from him spoils of war that he believes he deserves. Achilles' withdrawal has left the Greeks in a terrible situation, and they're being slaughtered by the Trojans, especially by the Trojan champion Hector. So Agamemnon sends an embassy of Odysseus, Patroclus, and several others to go appeal to Achilles on his ship to convince him to leave the ship to come back onto the battlefield and to fight the Trojans on behalf of the Greeks. The case that Odysseus makes to Achilles takes several parts. He begins by noting that the Greeks face disaster, military disaster, at the hands of Hector, and that they require Achilles' help. We need your help, he says. And then he makes several different types of appeal to Achilles. He notes that Hector, the great enemy of Achilles, is raging unchecked across the battlefield and seems to have the god Zeus on his side. He reminds Achilles that he will regret later on, if he chooses now not to help the Greeks and to let them be massacred, that later on he will regret his choice. He reminds Achilles that he has ignored his father's advice. When he left home, his father advised him to avoid vain quarrels and to work for the good of all the Greeks. But, Odysse but Achilles is not doing this now. Instead, he's sulking on his ship. Odysseus encourages Achilles again to put aside his anger and to help the Greeks, and then he uh, promises him lavish gifts from Agamemnon, and more than half of Odysseus's speech in total is taken up with describing the incredible gifts that Agamemnon has promised to Achilles if he will relent, put aside his anger, and agree to come out and rejoin the battle against the Trojans. It's an amazing amount of wealth, power, cities, his choice of daughters to marry, any number of wonderful things that Agamemnon is willing to offer to Achilles. Finally, Odysseus appeals to pity. He says, even if you disdain Agamemnon and all of his gifts, you should come return to the battle for the sake of your comrades, for the sake of the men you have fought alongside all these years in the battle for Troy, the men who are dying at the hands of the Trojans. For their sake, you should come and fight, and these men, if you save them, will honor you like a god, says Odysseus. Achilles gives his response to this appeal, and his response is a flat no. He says, absolutely not. I loathe Agamemnon. I will not accept any of his gifts. In fact, Achilles says, I, will not ex I would not come fight for Agamemnon if you offered me 10 times or 20 times as much wealth as you've just promised me now. Achilles notes that Agamemnon is stubborn and ungrateful and has treated Achilles unfairly, that his anger has not been assuaged, and furthermore, that he is leaving. He is going to pack up his ship and he is going to sail away in the morning after offering, offering sacrifices to the gods. And he says to the Greeks, if you get up early, you might see my ships passing over the horizon as I head home. In three days, I should return to my home in fertile, in fertile Pythia. Achilles even insults Agamemnon. He tells Odysseus, when you go back to bring the bad news to Agamemnon, I want you to tell him in public, in front of all the men, and I want you to tell him that their deaths at Hector's hands are his fault, not my fault. Now let's take a look at the case that Crito makes to Socrates when he appeals to him in his prison cell. He says to Socrates, you must save yourself. He says, if you refuse to escape and save your life, not only will I, Crito, lose a good friend, but also I will lose honor. I will be dishonored and shamed before the Athenians because people will think that I was able to save you, but that I chose not to, that I was too cheap or uh, not didn't value your, your life and your friendship enough to take the risks necessary to save you. When Socrates responds that this would be the opinion of the majority, but that people who are wise and good would know that Crito had done right, Crito responds that the majority is important. He says the majority, you must now agree, Socrates, can inflict harm upon a good man. In fact, they can inflict the greatest of harms. They can kill a man. 
Socrates denies this, and his denial is quite important for his overall philosophy. We'll talk about that later. Crito also says, Socrates, you should not worry about the risks that your friends are running to try to spring you from prison. We would be willing to bear this risk and met much more risk in order to save your life. He also accuses Socrates in language that Socrates is bound to take seriously. He says, Socrates, throwing your life away by submitting to execution when you could escape is unjust. It is not right. It is an objective wrong that you commit by giving the victory to your enemies, allowing them to kill you when you could preserve your life and go on doing philosophy in some different city. So the demands of justice, he says, require that Socrates escape from prison and preserve his life. Crito also appeals to pity when he says, Socrates, if you allow yourself to be executed, your sons will be left as orphans and your wife as a widow, and they will suffer the fate of orphans. They will suffer destitution and social uh, exile. This is not something that one should do to one's family who one owes an obligation to above all else. Better, Crito says, better to have not had any children at all than to have children and then abandon them by going willingly to your death. Crito ends his first appeal to Socrates by urging speed, saying to him, there's no time for debate and delay right now. Now is time for decision and action. So come with me now, be persuaded, and let's activate the escape plan. Let's look at some parallels now between the case that Odysseus makes to Achilles and the case that Crito makes to Socrates. Where do we find some parallels? There are some obvious parallels in that uh, Achilles is on his ship and refuses to leave, and Socrates is in his prison cell, and refuses to leave. But there are some other parallels as well in the type of argument that each man gives. Both Odysseus and Crito emphasize the need to act in order to prevent the victory of an enemy. So Odysseus says, Hector will win, the Trojans will win and wipe out the Greeks if Achilles does not come fight. Crito says, your enemies in the Athenian assembly will have won if they succeed in killing Socrates. So in order to thwart your enemies and prevent their victory, you should act immediately. In this case, the majority in Plato of the citizens of Athens, the Athenian democracy, is playing the role of Hector, the role that Hector played in Homer's story about the embassy to Achilles. Both men also appeal to pity, appeal to a group of people who have a special interest in seeing this action happen. So Odysseus says, Achilles, if you don't come fight, more of your friends and comrades who rely upon you to lead them in battle are going to be slaughtered. And Crito says, your family will suffer, Socrates, if you willingly submit to being executed. One major difference between these two stories is that whereas Achilles is motivated in his refusal mainly by honor, Socrates seems to be motivated by something else. And this is a question I will leave you with. What is it that motivates Socrates to disagree with Crito's case, to reject his advice, and to stay in prison waiting to be executed. And what does this reveal about Socrates' character? How can we understand Socrates being offered for us as a sort of new Achilles by Plato, as a model of Greek manhood that uh, fulfills, maybe in the realm of the intellect, what Achilles fulfilled in the realm of uh, being a warrior of great physical prowess? What virtues of Socrates do we find manifest in his reply to Crito, and how do they contrast with the virtues that we learn about Achilles, or the state of his character, in his reply to Odysseus? Another interesting connection between the embassy to Achilles in Homer's Iliad and the Crito dialogue is the reference to fertile Pythia. When Achilles says he's going to leave the battle the following day and sail away to his home, he says, with fair winds and the approval of the gods, on the third day I will arrive in fertile Pythia. This is precisely the passage from the Iliad that Socrates quotes to Crito at the beginning of the dialogue, when he says, I had a strange dream, a beautiful woman appeared to me and told me, Socrates, on the, on the third day you will arrive in fertile Pythia. So it's obvious that Plato, as the author, is placing in his audience's mind this embassy to Achilles, so that they might recognize, I think later on in the dialogue, that Crito's case to Socrates parallels in many important ways Odysseus's case to Achilles, but also differs from it in some important ways. That's all for now. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.